So very good day to all of you listeners out there. And today we want to talk about the Texas border crisis. And not sure if you all heard about it. It is in some of the mainstream news. But today we have Lyra here. Hello. And we have Lanshi. Hello. And Lanshi haven't been with us for a while, but I think this is one of the topics that sort of interests you, right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we've been doing two episodes of Trump and... I mean, we, we kept saying, right, Lara, why we go back to the American politics because there's just so much peril. And when you think about Texas, right, they are very much like Sarawak in a sense. Yes, most definitely. Energy resource. Energy resource uh, they have a strong voice for independence. And, and you know, somebody even said that they have a strong religious spirit. It, it, religious as in... You know, they are very, uh, they have a large percentage of Christians. They're very similar to Sarawak in a certain sense. It's almost like they are very fixated in certain ways of delivering certain things. Yep, yep. Yep, yep. And so that's, I mean, we have been to Texas and they even drive like Malaysian, right? <laughs> very, very uh, kind of aggressive. But if you have not heard about Texas, um, basically there is some sort of crisis you know, some call it invasion because a lot of migrants and we call them illegal migrants. Later, we'll look at the definitions. But basically, the southern border is opened. And and maybe, Lan I'll start with you because we have been looking at the whole issue of open border. It's a big problem in Europe. Um, not so much of a problem in Malaysia because, I mean, if you try to cross illegally into Malaysia, I mean, they basically might shoot you, right, and things like that. I mean, we have been to Australia. We know Australian border control is very tight. So uh, what do you make of this border control in United States? You, you know, I think why, why the current administration basically encourages open border? Yeah, I, I remember back in 2016, you know, during that presidential run, the, the, mm -hmm. that, that path the way for Trump first term, right? So one of the one of the key issue was also border, and I recall watching CNN where there's an interview between Pres Trump at that time and uh, you know Anderson Cooper if I'm not mistaken, mm -hmm. and um, after the interview and he was labelled xenophobia, he was labelled as Islamophobia, uh, you know someone who is like has no mercy and want to separate family and things like that, but today I think. We can understand the issue much more. Uh, we can see like all these border, uh, border, uh, op the border that's open in policy is really that is a hidden agenda. You know, you can almost see like it's intentional. Uh, it is even lawless, um, and it has a lot of problems in it. Mm. And we see kind of a unity, right? So, so like right, you know. It's not just the Democrats supporting. We have the Rep Republicans establishment supporting. Right now, there's a huge Senate bill that is being discussed and they want to legalize, I don't know, how many thousands per day. And they want to give amnesty. You know, there are literally millions of people. In fact, I remember one of my friends, her sister went to US to study and then the student visa expired and she decided to stay there and hopeful that she will get green card. Because... A lot of people stay there illegally and they might get a green card. If they don't, they just continue their life. Some stay for 10, 20 years, especially in certain areas where they call themselves sanctuary states, sanctuary cities. But going back to the broader picture, right? So we talk about Democrats, establishment, Republican, maybe the donor class, the big tech, you know, they kept on encouraging. Do you think there is a philosophical agenda there, maybe, in terms of why they... I mean, it's, it doesn't make sense, right, for you not to secure your border. Yeah, I think one of the very key issues that was discussed, especially in Trump, like his, the, the campaign, the whole thing is really founded on like securing the borders. Again, you, you begin to think why the second term, he is also still talking about securing the borders and drill, drill, drill. I think it's interesting that they are really, I think one, there is the, environmentalist sort of agenda because Texas is well known for the oil and gas industry, the 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 fuel, the gas. So I think there is that portion that they wanted to just sort of like, nope, let's do our green agenda, the EV mm -hmm. cars. But there's also another portion whereby 
let's just get like a lot of those illegal migrants coming in and basically you just have like a whole lot of scenario like very similar to Malaysia. I think it's nothing very foreign mm. to us, especially mm. like you are thinking about the voters count. If yeah. election in 2020 was rigged, then I mean, I think they are very, very concerned, especially the Democrats. They are very, very concerned that Trump might really, really make the return in this 2024. Yeah, you can really see in the media right now, there is sort of, I would say, control panic. Uh, but they are, but there's also on one hand, some people are kind of like managing expectation. If Trump returns, we can still manage. But of course, back to your point, basically, I think they want this open border so that they can fundamentally change the demographic, the voters' demographic. So, you, you know, in US, we use the term red, red state, which is Republican, blue, which is Democrat, and they want to shift Texas into state blue, basically. Oh. And of course, it's very, very difficult. You know, they basically need a net plus 1 million votes statewide just to have an impact. It's not easy. Even with cheating, it's not easy. So so that, that will be their, their policy. Then, of course, before we go into the actual Supreme Court case, which recently was decided, one of the hallmark principles, of course, is what they call catch and release. And I mean, if you're not familiar with catch and release, you can just go and Google. But it is so ridiculous. So, for example, you have the illegals coming in and they will catch them, they will round them up and they'll say, okay, we, so many of you, we can't handle the administration. See you soon. So, we're going to give you a court date. <laughs> we're going to give you a court date two months later. So, in the meantime, you're free to do whatever you want. Do you think they are coming back for the no court way. hearing? No, they just disappear into the no, system. Initially, I thought about catch and release. I thought, okay, catch and then you release back to your own country yeah. where you yeah. came from and then we'll see you in two months and see maybe there's a pathway for you. And who knew it was actually your United States itself? Yep, yep. And very interestingly that uh, Trump sort of made his campaign this time center around uh, migrations, immigrations, borders, so whether they like it or not, it's going to be a forefront issue, okay? So let's look at the decision, okay? Supreme Court decision, 22nd of January, very, very recently. And so in fact, Lanshi, you remember your, your father was here, mm -hmm. right? He was. And he was like, he, he, he said something very funny. He, <laughs> he, he said, uh, are the federal soldiers shooting at the state soldier? You know, they're they are thinking like there's war like that. But of course, you know, just for our, the, I'm not sure if you're all aware, US military is not allowed to go into any of the domestic cities. They are not allowed. So if there's any issue, they can have, so it's under DHS, uh, Department of Homeland Security, the FBI, the State Patrol, the, the National Guard. Military is not supposed to enter into the cities. Now, of course, you talk about Black Ops, CIA, that's a different story. So you can never, I mean, I mean, of course, you have military base and things like that. Then they'll be shipped out. Officially, they'll leave the country, but they can never be deployed within the borders of the country. So that that is a very, very important distinction. But anyway, coming back to the case, and um, basically what the Supreme Court did, now it's not a full-blown case. It is what we call a stay, you know, S-T-A-Y. So basically, there was an action where Texas sued the uh, DHAS for kind of, kind of, uh, because they wanted to to put certain barrier, uh, barbed wire, so that the illegal migrants cannot come in. Then DHS said, no, we want to remove that. So, at the court of appeal, that federal court, the appeal court sided with the state. So, DHS decided to appeal. So, pending the appeal, that means they are not even looking at the merits. So, for example. Uh, uh, we give a very simple example. Let's say, Lyra, you someone charged you and you were fined one million, and you decided to appeal, right? So while you appeal, do you need to pay the one million? Yeah. So so that that is what this decision is all about. So the Fed, the Supreme Court is saying that okay, we are still deciding who is right and wrong here, but in the meantime, we are not going to enforce what the appeal court have said. So so this is basically what we mean by state, and a very close decision five to four. In fact, the word used is temporary stay pending continual litigation. So it's not a final thing, and, but, but it kind of creates a, a bit hoo-ha, right? I mean, if you've been reading the news, and, and, and this is what uh, some news reporting say. I'm just going to read a quote. They say, why might this be alarming for states such as Texas, 
that want security and self-determination. I mean, that's the word that come back again and again, right? The ability to control. I mean, if you live in a house, even if it's a rented house, you deserve to to ensure nobody cross into your, your gate or fence, right? You can put a lock, even if it's rented. What more if that is your state? And of course, the conservative were very disappointed because two of the justices, uh, Roberts and uh, who is Barrett, they kind of... Now, it's not saying that they sided with the homeland security. It just basically means when they look at the argument in their mind, maybe when the full decision is made, there's a chance that they will support the federal government. So because of that, we shouldn't penalize them. So that's the mindset. A lot of people are trashing the justices. Yeah, I, I can understand where they're coming from, but you know, the judges, they have to do certain things. So I don't really blame them, but the real thing is really the why the federal government is continuing to encourage this kind of behavior. And that's what we want to discuss today, okay? So now, by the way, let's talk about uh, let's talk about illegal migrants, okay? So, so what do you understand with the word? I, I mean, one of the whole argument, you know, even when Trump mentioned all these things, so many people in Malaysia, I mean, I, I would say they are ignorant of the system there. They say, oh, United States is a nation of migrants. And in fact, we know, last you remember our friends, uh, you know, from, from, he's from Texas, right? He's Spanish descendant. And he himself is second generation migrant. And remember he said, look, we're not against migrant, we're against illegal migrant. So, so I think when we talk about illegal migrant, we're talking about people who doesn't want to, to cross, uh, who doesn't want to do the proper application. Uh, I mean, today you want to go to Australia, you want to become permanent residents. Now they have temporary residents because there are too many people who abuse the system. So, but anyway, Along the way, I'm sure both of you have read news that not only people who, you know, illegal migrants, you can include people who wanted a better life, maybe. They just do it illegally. But on the other hand, you actually have criminals, right? You have drug pusher, you have human trafficking. So what, what do you make of that? I mean, based on what you've been reading and things like that, is that a, a very serious crisis that is happening right now? Um, I would say that... Um, you know, if you really want to migrate or you, you want to go to a greener pasture to earn a living, why not choose a legal path, right? And and the thing with illegal migrants is really that you can't control, you don't know who is crossing the border into your country. I mean, this may be, like you say, someone who is as simple as like Indonesian coming over to, to work in a construction field, but it could be criminal as well. It could be drug pusher. It could be anyone. Uh, in the context of United States, it could be another jihadist, another terrorist. Mm -hmm. You know, and and given today this type of heightened uh, uh, sentiment uh, with what's happening with Middle East and things like that, uh, and and obviously after 9/11, you know, I mean, terrorism is not something new, um, and it's basically one. People can say, it's like, hey, why are you so uh, cruel, you know? It's like, why are you so not for human rights, da 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 <laughs> But on the other hand, it's really that what should happen is you need to screen people properly before you allow them to come into the country. I mean, the priority of a nation should be for the citizen, uh, one way or another. Yeah. So Lara, I'm sure you have heard the term, just like we mentioned already, century state and century city. So those are the jurisdiction. Supposedly, they say we welcome any migrants, legal or illegal. So of course, some of the funny things is you see states like Florida, Texas, when these people cross into, because they are all the southern states, that's where they're coming first. Okay, we don't welcome you, but all these New York, Illinois, they welcome you, so they put them in the bus and send them up there. So, so... Recently, you have seen that even those states cannot cope anymore, right? So, are you seeing, uh, uh, because it's an election year, obviously, and a lot of Democrats, especially in the more moderate seats, are in danger. Do you, do you see a shift from the Democrats or do you think they're still doubling or tripling no, down? No, I think most definitely they are doubling down. I think what they are really doing is, actually, I read that there is actually a census that is being taken to really see who are the 
illegal migrants, but why, why would you want to mm. do like a census on illegality of the people, you know? So, but when you really think about it, actually, it's like, hey, actually, we could infiltrate certain rigs, the red color states, whereby mm -hmm. they really just hope that if we pack more of these illegal migrants and hence we could, I mean, because what we saw with Trump's 2016 election winning, I mean, basically, like just a couple of hundred thousand votes in certain states, it makes yep. a huge lot of difference in terms mm. of the electoral college. So I think what we are seeing here is really they are really trying to pack certain states with like there's that sort of agenda almost deliberately to really just cause this few swing states to just shift towards their their goals. So I think it's really I would say it's very, very cunning of what they are trying mm. to do. But yet you begin to see because it really makes no sense. I mean with the century state not being able to cope if you can't I mean the inflation is like sky high, you can't even assist your own citizens, what more illegal mm. migrants, what, what more about human rights of other citizens, you know, that has nothing to do with you and you have to fund this group of people who are coming in illegally and, and like what Lanshi was saying, just the criminals. I mean, it's mm. just bizarre to think about this whole thing, you know. But this type of voter demographic uh, manipulation it's not something new for Malaysia. No, exactly, exactly. <laughs> we know I it want to say that quite well. Uh, I have to say. Yeah, I mean, remember, I mean, it, it, it's like, and that's why if we think about what happened in Malaysia, then you can also think about what is a solution because there is a way to counter this. So we think about in Malaysia those days we have a lot of phantom voters. We have Project IC. You know, we don't know what is the extent. and of course people vote multiple times and things like that. Now all this can only happen. Because is it in a way our national ID is a double-edged sword? You see, in America they don't have ID. In fact, they don't even have voter ID. That that's how ridiculous it is. So some estimated there are twenty million illegals. Now, of course, a lot of them would not want to risk, uh, you know, being caught and things like that. But they are given certain kind of motivation to come out to vote. So you know, just register and we give you I you you are able to just take a ballot and and, and kind of tick. So some may just took the chance, you know, and you, you know, like what you were saying just now, 500,000 plus or minus can determine the whole election. But coming back to Malaysia, and you, you see how eventually all this will nullify because people who understand our electoral role, they will say, look, if the voter turnout is high, then it's harder to cheat because all of a sudden you, you cannot send too many people because it will exceed the stream. Then of course, the second thing is uh, you, you, you start to have uh, what's the indelible ink and things like that, vote early. So, so at the end of the day, and that's why recently, remember, um, one of the conservative commentators, Charlie Kirk, was saying that they have they are focusing on disfranchised uh, voter, you know, people who are kind of disappointed with the whole thing. And they're looking at voters who didn't vote the last two times, 2020 and 2016. If you don't vote these two elections, something is wrong with you, right? You are like under the rock or something. So they are looking for these people try to find out why they didn't vote and maybe encourage them to vote. Because, and that's one of the great debate in America, I guess. A lot of people felt like our nation is so great, it can still survive another two-term Democrat. That's what a lot of Republicans are saying. I, I don't need to vote. A, a lot of Christians, unfortunately, are, are behaving like that. They're saying, that, oh, we don't need to do anything because we can still survive. But Malaysia is a different one. Right? I mean, we, we kind of go the other side, doom and gloom. Right? Remember the last few GE people say, if we don't change the government, it's the end. I remember I, we heard this when uh, 2014. Uh, and then it didn't happen. Then, then of course, after, after what's the thing, uh, Sheraton, everyone said the same thing. But, well, it's not the end of the world, right? So so that's there's that philosophical... That of course, everything we have discussed so far... Basically, the Democrats want to win election forever for foreseeable future. Anyway, coming back to the case, um, I think one of the, 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 the reaction after that is pretty interesting, right? We have seen Attorney General from 26 states kind of voicing their support. Um, and, and that's why we go back to the discussion about, uh, you know, there's this, this, uh, this division called National Guard. And in fact, I was doing a bit of reading. National Guard is not military. National Guard is called militia. And very interesting, you know, because I mean, you think about militia, what, what comes to your mind when you hear the word militia? Something that is not so legal. 
like you know underground Malaysia. not so formal uh, I mean <laughs> in my mind because you know we play computer games militia basically <laughs> you it's like your weapons are sticks like, you know it's like you're just very rudimentary kind of unit mm. and and why is this important because George Washington started with militia to fight the British so very interesting they they define National Guard under the Constitution as militias because they are not technically uh, they are not technically the military. So you know the Second Amendment allows self-defense. So if there's a need and we say, look, the government has become too too much of a tyrant, everyone please uh, exercise your Second Amendment, take your gun, and you just form militia. And that's how the war for independence started. They just formed militia against the mighty, the most powerful military in the world at that time, the British. And, and they won. So I, I guess, I mean, this is a bit of history for us to understand. So, of course, you, you one of the things that has happened is that some states began to tell Texas we're going to send National Guard. And by the way, National Guard is sort of shared between federal and state. So the federal government wants to say maybe we will make National Guard federal. So, so all these things is leading to another point we want to talk about, which is self-determination, federal versus state uh, kind of... Uh, balance right and, and immediately uh i think like this one you, you you read right i think just one or two days after the whole decision did, did you uh did you see the news about how the federal government biden administration basically stopped the approval for lng uh gas export and i mean talk about lng is such such a comparison with sarawak right i mean sarawak has the fourth largest lng reserve in the world texas is the third largest exporter of LNG in the world. And all of a sudden they say, and of course Biden come out and say, well, it's a green economy and things like that. Do you think is, do you think he's upping up the game against Yeah, Texas? I think so. It's, it's quite deliberate, I would say. I mean, it's, yes, as much as he say, no, 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 actually, we are just being very friendly here. I don't think so. You see, when they, they talk about I mean, so much consequences for what they're doing, yet they still double down. Do you think they're stupid or they have some sort of secret confidence there? I think the ship has long sail. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, talking about not preparing enough for a campaign, I mean, because we were just talking in our own like private discussion whereby how come the Republican, they have their own caucuses whereby well, what's Democrat doing? And I think because... The ship has long gone so that they have to just, by hook or by crook, just back out this current administration. Have you heard the rumor that some people are trying to prep Michelle Obama? And in fact, some from the Republicans say the only person that is capable of even challenging Trump is Michelle Obama. So any comments from both of you? I think maybe Governor Newsom will make a better choice. <laughs> Newsom, Newsom, Newsom is smart enough to kind of... Uh, also, word he he kind of uh, take himself out from consideration. I think he's not stupid because he doesn't want to get into this fight now. He's still young. He has a long future. I mean, if we presume presumably that the Democrats are not fully destroyed, so but but what what do you both think of this rumor? Any substance? Any logic? I mean, if if that is really the case, I think Democrats is really getting very desperate, which I think they are. Is she better than? Biden. Biden, though. Uh, no. I mean, mm. if Michelle Obama is going to be the candidate, or, you know, quite unlikely, I mean, if she is the next president, I don't think she's going to be the one who is running the show. Of course, in of front. course not. I mean, she's just going to be a puppet. A puppet. Uh, just like just Biden like is Biden somewhat is a puppet. I mean, people say that, right? I mean, with his. His mental capacity that is really, it's obvious to the world that it's really becoming worse. Um, and a lot of people is just asking, you know, who is really running the White House? Definitely, I mean, for those uh, who is who has been following the news developments, and a lot of people can begin to see that, look, Biden is not running. It, it's basically a, a third term for Obama. And because you, you look at the staff, you look at the crew around him, it's all, it's all Obama's people. And, and the other thing I want to mention, and this is my, my point of view, is that Michelle Obama is not Hillary Clinton. I think she doesn't have 
necessarily the political ambition I would say. Yeah, I, I think she's woke. She is into the the progressive agenda and things like that. But I don't think she is you know, she's not Saul Alinsky's disciple like And she might not be Hillary. necessary I mean it's like she's a uh, Obama is a two terms president, she's the president's wife. Probably quite comfortable, you know. It's like Yeah, basically she doesn't have the political ambition, I'll say. Uh, I mean it, that kind of impression. So so that is why, I mean, if she's quite prepared to be the fourth term for Obama, I think, you know, if she say yes, they'll will, they will be kind of doing all the prep 18 months before, 24 months before, they'll be kind of, it, it, I mean, look at DeSantis, like, like one year ago, before he dropped out, he already kind of do all the pseudo presidential campaign without announcing. And actually that sort of did him a great disservice, right? I, Lara, I just realized that we did an episode on DeSantis in June last year. So if you want to look at the analysis, quite, I mean, I, I think a lot of things we said kind of happen, right? So so if you want to to listen, to, I mean, it's, it's kind of outdated, but I just check in the notes. But anyway, I want to kind of wrap up today. And in fact, uh, we, we actually did an episode on self-determination with our good friend, Michelle. Haven't published yet, but I think right after this episode, we will publish because kind of, uh, matches with what we discussed. But I want to finish off today and talk about self-determination. Because when you look at open border, is when you bring in a lot of people who they don't have the merits, they don't have the legality. Okay, maybe l- let's go to a more fundamental question. Do you feel that it is a requirement for any migrants, legal or illegal? If you want to be migrants, you have to to be able to contribute to the nation. You can't just be a parasite. Is this a fundamentally reasonable uh, requirement? Yeah, most definitely. I think I'm, I'm a firm believer, if you don't work, you don't eat. <laughs> 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 no, I mean, but having, I mean, jokes aside, I think it, I mean, if you look at the criteria of even like Australian PR, I mean, there are a lot of skill set, skill base, sort of competency test that has to be really done. So I felt like there, is, there should be a sort of value adding to the, to the society in general, because that's how you begin to see that every society can progress forward and not backwards. Mm. So I think legal, illegal, there should be a contribution to the society. Yeah, and it's like, uh, I mean, I mean, we say every nation should have a right to prevent blood suckers, right? And, but now you're, you're, you're look, at, you look at Europe now. Europe is basically, you, you know, somebody say Europe basically is two or three years ahead of US in terms of the movement. And so we saw Brexit first, right? Then we saw Trump. So look at their borders issue. They are, it is manifesting fully, right? In fact, you have some top EU leaders say, look, uh, border security is a gone case, cannot be done. But then you look at states like Poland, Hungary, much smaller states with, with much less resources they are able to control. I, I mean, if, if you put barbed wire, you put machine gun there, or you have Israel's Iron Dome, do you think you cannot keep people out? I think you can. It, I mean, if, if there's a will, there's a way, right? But but what, what else uh, about self-determination? Because when you allowed people to come in, and in fact, I was just thinking about the, whole, the Obamacare, you know, the insurance, because... Not, not quite the same thing, but remember when they nationalized the health insurance, basically you want a larger pool of people to receive the benefit. When you do that with the same amount of resources, the benefit is going to get diluted, right? Of course. And it's the same. It's like we have X number of resources. We have 30 million people. I mean, Malaysia, we have 35 million. If you just bring in another 10 million today, it's like not enough resources to share. And that's what your, your father always say also, right? I mean, these people, they, they also, in, in fact, we, we talk about control price item, rice, oil, and, you know, we have a lot of illegal migrants. Yes, for humanitarian reasons, they can buy, they, you know, the, the enforcement is not so strict, but it still dilutes the resources. When when all these people are buying, then all of a sudden, oh, you say, oh, today we have a special rice. I, I was shocked to find out that the rice per kilo now is, because we don't eat so much rice. <laughs> and it's like, three something already per kilo. So imagine government say, oh, we have a special Chinese New Year rice, 220 per kilo, but we only have 10 ton. 
and your your your, your illegal migrant might be the first to queue up and buy all the things, and by the time you want to go, no more. I, mean, I just wonder, right? I mean, in World War Two, that I mean, one of the greatest thing that the whole nation came out from. I mean, like talking about like UK, there's a lot of rationing mm. that's going on. I think definitely yeah. there's some sort of. I mean, even talking about like our own national registration, all this came about because there's that allocation of resources. Mm. You need to mm. be able to verify the citizenship before before resources are even being given to you. Yeah, in fact, that is one of the reasons for national ID. And because they are fighting communists and things like that, and those days the communists went into the jungle, the ID will sort of differentiate whether you are a citizen of Malaya, those days, then of course, Sabah, Sarawak, Malaysia, or you are just a communist that tries to kill the nation. So, I, I mean, it's just common sense, right? So, I, I mean, the politician cannot be so stupid. So the only other explanation is that what we had discussed earlier on the ulterior agenda to fundamentally change. So double down, triple down, seems that they are not repentant. And I, I guess maybe the only thing that can really wake them out is a huge loss in election. Yeah. I, 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 would, I just want to add something like, you know, especially talking about resources, healthcare resources. Uh, in the days where, you know, I used to work in uh, the public hospital, there is always that um, discussion that will take place, for example, if there is a foreign worker, you know, worse still, if they have no passport and they, are, they need intensive mm. care, which is really quite expensive. I mean, if you talk about today, if someone is admitted to intensive care unit, just the basic care can cost up to a thousand, per, thousand plus per day. So, um, so there, there's always that that balance that one need to strike, like whether you want to admit this person who is not a Malaysian, no passport, but taking up a resources and potentially taking up an intensive care bed away from another fellow fellow Malaysian. Um, and you know how much money is the government and then I, 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 how much taxpayer money is going to go into funding this person health care. I mean, it sounds very not humanitarian, but that is just the reality, you know. Like, but if you see more and more of these illegal migrants who cannot fund their own healthcare, cannot fund their, you know, children's education healthcare. Some of them they brought up here. Mm. Whose whose money is going to get sucked up to 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 maintain them? You know. Yeah. So so eventually it, it becomes a humanitarian crisis, and. And the sad thing is you have the opportunity to limit the damage, but it's almost like you intentionally doesn't want to deal with it. And and of course, we haven't even talked about the economic reason for that, you know, especially for the for the Republican, uh, the, those donor class politician. It's basically they say, oh, these people are, are cheap labor. Uh, they will do... Th and that's the argument in Malaysia. Also, why we have such a large... I mean, of course... We have, we actually, a lot of our migrants are legal, but then when their permit expire, they stay and become illegal. That, that's how we have illegal here. Whereas over there, it's just open the open the door and let them come in. But the impact is the same. When they stay, they, they took the resources. I mean, you think about every family, you have your budget, you have certain expenses. Cannot be that you, you before you you fulfill the, the need of your budget and expenses, you take the money and, and give to an, an outsider. It, it just doesn't make sense, right? In your university mm. day, we, we will have friends who come and mm. quote-unquote overstay their, <laughs> their term in our house and conveniently just yeah. not pay, yeah. but take advantage, take advantage and tag, a, tag along. But it, it's usually you, you are providing resources that you are willing to let them have. But now we're talking about you don't even have enough yeah. And that's the whole issue. If you have enough, then uh, then it's okay. And, and that's what the other thing about United States is really, and this is more of a historical observation. After World War Two, they remain maybe the single largest nation not truly affected. I mean, to say not affected is also not correct. They contributed more than two million soldiers and things, but as a whole, their nation was not destroyed. So after that, the whole world became freeloader. And you look at all the Paris Accord and things like that. Almost every treaty, I mean, even look at Ukraine, look at NATO, everything you can name, they almost expect the American to pay more. And so they have become, you know, everyone become freeloader. 
and, and yet they want to criticize. But basically, the, the MAGA movement made America great again is saying that, look, we don't mind helping, but not at the expense of our own people. Yeah. And that's basically the the very basic of uh, what was the theme already? That one of the things is, is uh, the the right to pursue happiness, right? That that's a very very basic. Because if you don't even have the opportunity, then what's the point? You help other people. So we haven't even gone into uh, the, the Malaysian side, uh, the the state and federal. But maybe I think after Michelle's episode, we can do another episode because I, I think that's really interesting. Now that we have a new Argon in Malaysia, we have a new governor in Sarawak. It felt almost like a new era, right? Okay, so maybe that will be our next episode, right? So before we end, any other final point regarding these taxes? I mean, we, we are not we purposely didn't want to become too technical here. But it's just yeah, I just find it interesting that once in a while people kind of mention or have have you heard about it? It is a huge news there, but maybe in Malaysia, people are not so aware. But there's just quite a bit of lesson for us to adopt. Yeah, nothing much. But I would say that, you know, I think now, hopefully people can see a bit clearer, you know, what they couldn't see one or two presidential terms ago. I think with the mainstream media that's trying to, to, to really twist the story, but I think the, the whole the magnitude of the whole border problem has really is has gone out of hand and uh, and I think it's awakening for the voters you know what, what what do they really want or are they going to still hide in their house and not come out to vote well, one of the things uh, not you mentioned and this will be the last point really <laughs> then we finish and it's really when you talk about the media and I think one of the reason why the Democrats are kind of now, I know they are a bit desperate because they, they are in a difficult position, you know, to replace Biden or, or what. But they always have the confidence that the media, the big tech will help to manipulate the whole atmosphere. But when you look at all the polls that come out, even polls from the traditional mainstream media, legacy media, the polls are showing that Biden and Democrats are not going to do well. So that means the large percentage of the voters in America are sort of they sort of realize that the, the mainstream media has been bullshitting to them. And that's why it doesn't work. And I think that's one of the reasons for their panic because they know that the media doesn't have the same influence as 2020 or 2016. And you, you start to have all the, uh, all the journalists, uh, citizens reporting. And, and then, of course, we have to thank Elon Musk for liberating ads because all of a sudden a lot of the conservative influencer can stay there, you know. And, and you'll be surprised people go to social media for political commentary. Or I, I should say they, they go there to be persuaded. So, yeah, at the end of the day, election is about persuading. I mean, some people like, like us, we are not going to be persuaded one way or another, but there will be that 20, 30% that can be shifted. Yep. But anyway, in the next episode, hopefully, um, we will talk about uh, more self-determination and pursuit of happiness. So until next time, bye-bye for now. Bye.